Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Terry Brock. Terry is a, an amazing speaker. He's been speaking in over 44 countries in the world, He's talking about technology. And you're going to learn today how to use video to improve your relationship in business. And it has a lot of uh, tips that he's been applying for himself. So enjoy my conversation with Terry Brock. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meeting podcast. And today I am absolutely delighted to finally find the time in his very busy agenda to speak with a, a legend. And, and it's not, it's really an understatement uh, in the speaking industry, in the meetings and event industry. Uh, any award you can think of uh, as a speaker, he's got it. Uh, he's been uh, a tremendous experience he's going to share with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Terry Brock. Terry, thank you so much for taking the time. Eric, it is an honor to be here with you, sir. Really looking forward to creating some magic with you today. So, yeah, and, and what I like with you is that uh, you're so versatile. Is that the word in English? You're doing so many different things. You have a, a tremendous experience and journey. So, first of all, if you can share... Uh, with uh, the, the people listening, what is the journey of uh, Terry Brock? Where did you start? Uh, why, what is your professional career? And how really did you, you came up to the, the, the speaking industry and, and what gets you there? Because that, that's, that I just think is fascinating. Well, I look at myself as a communicator. I've been doing that since I was a little kid. Actually, it was in third grade. I stood up in front in, on the church and I read the Christmas story. So I was doing some speaking even then and then in high school, did a little bit more. And undergrad degree was radio, TV and newspaper. I worked in radio, worked in newspaper and got a chance to do that. And then went on for the MBA and marketing to study those kind of things. But I've been in the speaking, a professional speaker since 1983. So uh, after 38, 39 years, I figure I'm off to a good start and always learning more, always learning new. I kind of like to think of myself as in second week of kindergarten heading for a PhD. So I figure I got a long way to go still, but I've been able to speak in, uh, oh, let's see, 44 countries and counting now. And uh, not a whole lot during the COVID thing, but I've been yeah. still doing that, getting out and speaking to many different kinds of organizations from Fortune 10 companies down to solo practitioners and showing people how to use technology, leverage that to build relationships. So I think that's what meetings industry is really about. It's about relationships and connecting with people. We do a lot of it now, of course, virtually. And we're getting back into more in person. But I think that's what it's really all about communicating and building relationships. And how did you learn about speaking industry and being a speaker uh, as a profession? Because, quite frankly, coming from Belgium, uh, there might have been some speakers uh, at that time, but there was really something unknown to me until I, I you know, obviously joined the meetings industry and started meeting people. So, what do you remember? What was the, who was the person or was the tipping point when you, you thought, hmm, that actually can be uh, what I'm doing full time? Well, actually, it was when I got out of the MBA program, I there was this newfangled thing out there called spreadsheets. And uh, it was brand new at the time. And so I kind of thought, well, that looks very similar to what we did with paper and pencil. I remember doing it that way in the cash flow statements that we would put together in finance class and those kind of things. I thought, I bet you I could do it. So I taught myself how to use a computer. I had to, I actually enrolled in another course after graduation, just so I could get access to the computer room and went in there, taught myself how to use a computer, taught myself how to use the spreadsheets and start putting those together. And then I started doing it for people that were doing investing in real estate. They loved it because I could change one number and it would ripple across. They, that was exciting. You know, people see it. And then I started teaching uh, some people on how to do this, showing a couple people here and there. And then I thought, you know, maybe somebody would be interested in paying me to show them how to do this thing. So I started doing some training and doing that. I had been natural in doing some uh, speaking before and just didn't really enjoyed it. And then I found there was a company in town where I was at that time in Atlanta that was looking for someone to do training specifically on the spreadsheets that I was working with. I started with one called Lotus One Two Three. That's exactly what I was thinking about. Lotus One Two Three. Yes. Yeah, and actually started with SuperCalc before that wow. because VisiCalc was the first, and then they came out with SuperCalc, which is a little bit better. I trained myself on SuperCalc. Eric, it was even so like this, where you had a left and a right arrow key on the computer. That was it. There was no up and down. And to go up and down, you had to press the space bar, then press the up arrow key or the down arrow key. I mean, and then there was just there was no trading, any of that. But I taught myself how to use Lotus one, two, three, and I found something that was a real key. 
in their manual, the big thick manual that no one ever reads, I found a phone number, area code 617, which is Boston. And that's where they're based. And I called that number and I got through to people so that then I could start calling them saying, hey, I'm using your product. They go, really? Well, that's good. Because not many people were at that time. And I said, but how do you do da 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 They go, oh, well, actually, we'll do it. Too. I said, well, I'm right in front of my computer right now. How do I do that? And I learned how to do it and started showing people how to do it more and more. And then eventually, as I was uh, doing some courses at a place where they were doing some training on it, someone came who was with the Georgia Society of CPAs, the Certified uh, Public Accountants. Yeah. And she said, hmm, we've been thinking of offering this to our, uh, you know, our CPAs. Do you know much about finance and accounting? I said, well, yeah, I had to learn all that stuff in the MBA program, even though that was not my major. My major was marketing, but I learned that stuff. And so I developed programs for it and I started showing CPAs how to do that and uh, ended up eventually 27 state societies of CPAs and the wow. American Institute of CPAs. Eric, it was really fun, though. Back then, I would say, watch it. I'd be in front of a group of accountants and I'd say, watch this. I'm going to change this one number here and look at all the numbers ripple through on the spreadsheet. And they don't, they, I'd do it and they'd go, oh. Look at that. It was like many of those CPAs came dangerously close to actually having an emotion. Wow. It was something, you know, to see that they were they wondering what to do with that. But I did that and then started slowly growing from there. And I spoke for like five years until I was speaking up in New York City. I remember I was at the Marriott Marquis and I did, uh, there was a three day program for state societies of CPAs around the country. I showed them how to do a lot. And then on Saturday, there was this famous speaker that was going to be there. I'd heard of him before and I made sure I got there early. He was on at nine. I arrived at eight o'clock just to see, to make sure I could see him. And he was there. And we started talking. I said, I'm a speaker also here. And he said, oh, he's a speaker, does a lot. And he said, by the way, are you a member of the National Speakers Association? And I said, what is that? <laughs> oh, well, here, got a pad of paper and a pen. And he wrote down the phone number and said, here it is. We do this and we help speakers. We're working with speakers to work with others and learn how to do it. And I thought, okay, this sounds good. And is this only national? He said, oh, no, we also have chapters. At the time I was in Atlanta and I said, do you have a chapter there? And he said, yes, they do. And so I thought, okay, that's good. Well, I thanked him, listened to his presentation. And then I realized I had to make a decision. I had been doing it on my own for a long time. And it was okay, but you can only go so far by yourself. I made the decision to get involved, mm -hmm. not only with the National Speakers Association call there, but with the local chapter. And that's what really made a difference for me, getting involved in the association. We know people, and you know um, as well as I do, that there are many uh, good associations out there, but yeah. just joining is not enough. You've got to really get involved. So I got involved and I became a co-chair of a speaker school they were offering. And then they asked me to be a VP of finance for the chapter and then eventually became president of the chapter and started working. And I found that really learned that way. And the National Speakers Association helped me enormously uh, professionally and also meeting wonderful people like yourself and getting a chance to know many people. So it's been a, a good thing. I think it just shows the importance of associations and being actively involved in the right associations. Absolutely. And, and, and I know that uh, now that, uh, you know, we're starting to uh, slowly reopen everything. Um, a lot of people, a lot of younger people are just wondering, uh, should I get involved in the association? What is the value of a membership? Uh, and, and I must say that uh, to, to your point, by getting involved, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you're meeting a lot of people, you're learning, you're getting uh, insights on what's going on in the industry, it give you ideas, uh, ideas for your business, uh, and really changed my life to, to be involved, uh, in my case, with, uh, with MPI. But it's, it's yes. really uh, the, being involved um, that, that get open doors that you would not even know that uh, there are doors like that. Is that the way... Uh, that you, you follow to uh, now being able to, to speak in, what do you say, 44 countries in the world? Was it thanks to uh, NSA or was it thanks to uh, the corporate uh, and all the speaking you were doing? It was a combination, but NSA gave me the training, gave me the motivation, the how-tos of doing it. When you'd sit down with someone and you'd listen to them uh, give a presentation, that's one thing. Those are very good. But also when you get to know people, when you say, hey, I really liked your presentation and I'd like to buy you lunch or buy you a drink tonight, we can talk. You get to know them and then you then see that they're going to give value to you and you give them lots of value. Start by giving them value first is the way to do it. 
then you learn. And so that leads to one thing and to another. And people say, oh, Terry, I've seen you speak before. Uh, we've got a group over here that needs someone to talk about this topic. And I was doing a lot of work and still am on uh, technology, social media now and cryptocurrencies, things like that. But when see people will see you and they say, hey, we've got a meeting coming up. Would you be able to help us on this? And we can pay you this amount of money, and do it. And you say, okay. And I find this is how it works. You're building relationships and really helping others, providing for help them solve the problems that they have. And between the, the Lotus 1 to 3 and uh, the uh, early uh, user of uh, Skype, in between the two, have you always been speaking about technology or do you develop uh, other, uh, not skills, but other topics that uh, you, you like to, to speak about? Yeah, technology has been an integral part of what I'm doing because I was there when it was brand new, showing people what to do. And here's new, amazing things you can get done, not just because I'm a nerd, you know, I like playing with the technology, but here's the business reason to do it. Here's why you can do uh, more, you can make more sales, you can be more productive. But also, I really like being around people. So I started talking about relationship marketing. I've done a lot of presentations on relationship marketing and the ways to think. And we blend technology into that mm -hmm. because technology now becomes not just another thing. It's an integral part of what we do with life to make our lives better. You use the right way. Technology can help us to build better relationships with others. Like, for instance, right now, you and I are talking to each other. We can see each other clearly. And how, how's my video and audio coming through, by the way? Excellent. Yeah, so we can do that. We can see it. It's almost as if we were in the same room seated across a table from each other, mm -hmm. almost. And so it's really good. But now we can do this worldwide. We're using technology to build relationships. Now, you know, as well as I do, you're reaching people around the world, Eric. You are making a dramatically positive statement on the world, connecting people, bringing people together as the meetings industry does. It's such a magical thing to me that you get the right amount of people together. They've got an area of interest, and then we kind of mix them up. You meet new people, you renew old friendships, and you realize, hey, we can help each other on this. I'm going to help them on that. They're going to help me on this. And we actually do much better in our world, and I'd say in our lives, because if we use the technology the right way, it really can facilitate that. So for me, it's been talking about relationships, talking about technology. One thing I'm excited about, particularly now, and speaking at a number of different conferences as an MC, as well as speaking and addressing, is crypto cryptocurrencies, Block, blockchain, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, they are really opening up po possibilities for people around the world. And I think it's pretty exciting. Absolutely. Uh, from the moment you've been using technology and, uh, you know, I, I was just sharing with my daughters recently that there are more technology, more power in their phone than what was used by NASA to send people on the moon. Yes. It's kind of mind boggling. Um, how have you seen the evolution from, from Skype where you finally can call all over the world uh, almost for free and then seeing people. What is your advice for, for business leaders when it comes to using video for business? I think video is one of the most powerful tools you can have for business today. Matter of fact, I'll even go so far as to say, if you don't know how to communicate with video very well and effectively, you're hampering your career. You're holding yourself back because this is how we communicate today. It'd be the same as if you couldn't use a telephone and you think, well, how do I use a telephone? I don't want to do that. If you'd been that way years ago, you would limit yourself dramatically. And I think that we've seen video as a way for people to get together. That was really accelerated with the pandemic when we saw it come about because we were forced to. Before the pandemic, I was doing a lot of programs uh, virtually and uh, doing those, but often we would hear meeting planners say, eh, we don't want you to be here virtually. We want you right here in person because in person is always better. It was almost uh, axiomatic in their minds that this is the way you must do it. And I understand that. I get that. Being there in person, sitting down with people over some drinks, over a meal at the hotel for the convention, uh, the chance meeting in the hall, all those kind of things. Yes, they're very important, but we can still do a lot with video that we can't do in uh, physical. We realize that a manager that needs to send somebody from New York to see a potential client in Los Angeles realizes, okay, you're going to lose a day getting out there. And then you're going to be there for a few minutes, maybe, and maybe that's going to probably take a day and then another day to come back. You've lost three days. Whereas if we know how to do video right, 
We've done it properly. We've been trained on how to present. Yes, you can see that client, potential client over in Los Angeles from your New York offices, but you could also see them in Tokyo or in London and several places all in the same day. And now we realize that more than ever. So I think we're going forward. We're going to be doing a lot with both video as well as in person. We yeah, cherish we, those in person and we'll do both. Yeah, it really depends uh, for what. Uh, you know, I think in, in a formal introductory meeting, absolutely. Uh, training, absolutely. When it comes to negotiation, uh, seeing the nonverbal of the person, seeing who they're looking at in the room. Uh, plus, as you mentioned, the serendipity of meeting people uh, at trade show. That is not something that I see going on on on, uh, on video. And, and we've seen it during COVID. Everybody was tried to do a trade show online. Um, it, it was uh, at best okay, most of the time a disaster. Uh, because people don't have the the same interaction. On the other hand, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, doing uh, regular business or meetings or training uh, absolutely on video. Now, you, you just say something that I think is very important. Uh, and in your past, like uh, like the telephone, you need to be able to use the video. Uh, that is extremely important. So what, what are your recommendations when it comes to the type of behaviors that people should have on video uh, besides the you're on mute uh, and uh, can you share your screen? What, what are the the, uh, the most important uh, behavior that people should think about? Yeah, well, the most important thing that you can do in video is audio. Have very good audio because if you can't hear someone, they'll go el elsewhere. You are competing with the entire internet when you're on video. Mm -hmm. People can easily jump over here. Oh, oh here's a message. It just came in on my cell phone. I got to check this and those kind of things. If they can't hear you, it's not going to work. For instance, my voice, you say, is my voice coming through okay now? Yeah, it yeah. always been, yeah. And you notice I've got a microphone right here. So this way, it's right there. You see it. You know that it's there. But for instance, suppose it's back there. Now, how's my voice coming through now? Can you repeat what you said? Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> That's very far. That? That's what it like. You can't hear it, and people often will do that, and they'll they'll be away from their their microphone, or they're not paying attention to it. Make sure you've got good microphone. Now, I've got this one right here. This is the Yeti microphone. It's been around for a long time, and it gives us the ability to have some good clear sound. But get a good external microphone. Sometimes the microphones in the computer can be good, but you can also get some nasty feedback with that. So take care of that. Yes, there you go. What kind of microphone is that? I don't even know. I follow. Uh... I follow what uh, my friend Chris Kremitzus told me to do to record podcast. I bought exactly what he told me that, you know, I'm the type of person who would rather ask somebody who knows better and just follow their advice. So that's, that's a good, that's good, good way to do it often. And so that's one thing to do. But another one that's very important, and then you might have seen this a lot with Skype or with Zoom, et cetera. Do you ever have the people who are talking to you and they're looking over here talking to you? See, they're always looking over this way. They're not looking right there into the webcam, very important that you position it properly so you're looking directly into the webcam. You wanna make sure that you have that there. And also don't do it this here, I'm gonna have some fun with this. Let me show you. You ever have these kind where they're talking to you like this, you know, mm. and they're looking up like that. We call these the nose hair shots, you know, like that. Or the opposite of that would be if they're doing uh, the dentist shot, you know, here, here's the dentist kind of thing, you know, you're coming at it like that way. Well, it doesn't look as good. And what happens is people will make judgments about you and your ability to communicate. Those are two critical areas. But another thing is very important. I learned this when I was working with Skype. I was uh, Skype's chief enterprise blogger and worked with them, did a lot of things with it, is what's behind you. In the background, mm -hmm. I would often, this was a few years ago, often we would demonstrate new techniques and new technologies that we had with Skype. And it was my job to go out and to interview a lot of people. Often they were uh, guys that were real techy and nerdy, knew a lot about technology, but they might miss a few other areas. And I remember times we would get sit down, we'd say, okay, you know, we, we check your audio, we're checking the video, make sure everything's good, all the connections are good. But Oh, um, Charlie, before we go on, are you sure you want the world to see that particular picture that's over here behind you? And they'd look and go, oh, no, they have to pull that down. And they go, no, no, no. I, I've seen, the worst I've seen, it, it was, uh, you know, the screen when you have, I don't know, 24 different screen at once. Yeah, it's the gallery view. The gallery view, thank you very much. And, and a guy basically was naked going out of his bathroom 
uh, oh, no. on, the, on the company uh, on the company Zoom, and everybody telling him that he was on mute, so he, he had to switch off the fo- uh, the uh, the sound. That was terrible. But anyway, yeah. that, that's that's obviously the extreme. Um, wh- when you're talking about business relationship, uh, how do you use video and and not necessarily in, in a synchronous way? Uh, but what are the tools that you could be using in terms of video? Because uh, I've seen more and more people sending messages uh, that obviously are not not live, uh, pre-recorded, uh, which is kind of uh, separating them from the crowd. Absolutely. Thanks for asking that. That is extraordinarily important. I've been using tools like that for a while. And when you can send someone a video of yourself, when I send a video and I go, Eric, hey, it was great to meet you the other day at the meeting we had last Tuesday. And I really like what you said about the Oogie Floppers and the Oogie Flopper and the Woogie Woogies are really good too. Like we were talking about that. And I think we can do it. Matter of fact, I'm going to send you something right now that will help you. Here it is. Da 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 da. You're seeing it's me. I'm not sending you a form letter. You can see my expressions like you were mentioning. You can tell. I think, for instance, when you really use video right, you can connect with people. Like, for instance, Eric, you and I are good friends right now. We could, And if I looked at you and I sent you a text and I said, Eric, you looked real good today. Okay, there's the text. And then I send that as text. That's one thing. You could interpret it different ways. If, on the other hand, because you and I are close, we know each other real well, and, I'm, and I send you a message in video, I go, yeah, Eric, you looked real good today. You know, hey, I'm joking with you. I'm, I'm uh, having fun. And, and it strengthens the relationship. You see, you can communicate those emotions, mm-hmm. the inflections, mm-hmm. the eye contact, the facial expressions. All of that is so much more important because that's how we communicate naturally. It's how we've been doing it since Og was back in the cave inventing this thing called the wheel, you know, getting, a, you know, chipping it down, chipping that stone. Well, we watch people, how they're reacting and we see their reaction. Matter of fact, it was just interesting. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to someone who was interested in working with me, uh, doing some coaching for her. And she has been sending out notices regularly to people where she does coaching with them. And she puts in there, video is mandatory. She mm-hmm. insists on using mm-hmm. video with people. I thought, oh, that's interesting. I love video. I use it all the time. But uh, to say it was mandatory, I thought, good, why is that? And she said the same things you were talking about. She wants to see how people react, wants to be able to watch those facial expressions. Because if you're telling me something, I'm going like that. I'm not saying a word, but you know exactly what I'm thinking. You know, Or if you're saying something, I'm going, really? Well, that's kind of nice. Okay, you, you've been able to see it as a human being. It really helps us. And what we want to do is we want to humanize the virtual experience more, figure out ways. And I think that's where the trade shows, I would say, could be done much better with the right kind of training mm-hmm. and learning what to do. Are they as good as the in-person ones? Well, no, but we might do something different, slightly different. It depends on the goals and what we can do by using a lot of interaction where people are not just uh, sitting here. One of the things, for example, that we found really good, Gina, my partner and I have a program called Video Rock Stars. We meet every week and we have people that come in and they're uh, learning how to present on video better. We use breakout rooms and those breakout rooms in Zoom are really good because people get a chance to say, okay, here's the main topic we've had. And we had a speaker who talked about this. We're going to break up into groups of three or four and we want you to discuss A, B, C, and D. So now they're getting interaction. They're involved. They're not just sitting back checking out their cell phone because with three people there and everyone's expected to give something you're doing. It. Then you go back into the main group and you have that person who was in, can speak for the group. We've done this often in regular meetings in, in person where you break up into groups, you discuss something and come back and share it. We all learn more that way. So I would say to my fellow presenters, more than ever, we don't want just the sage on the stage. Someone standing there and saying, I will tell you what things are. We need somebody that can be a better facilitator, someone who can pull from the audience, realizing that, as the Japanese say, and we use it a lot out in Silicon Valley, none of us is as smart as all of us. Mm -hmm. And so we take that and blend it in. And I think a wise communicator today, the wise speaker, communicator, coach, consultant, is going to be one who can pull from other areas bring those together in a synthesis, and then deliver some real value. Awesome. Awesome. Derry, um, w- when it comes to using the, those videos, uh, but really to strengthen business relationship, after what we've seen, the shift of really working remote and, and what's going to come up in the future, what probably uh, 
a mix of a uh, few days in the office and the less uh, remote. What are what are your recommendation uh, for for people that uh, own their business when it comes to managing their team on one hand and managing the client relationship on the other? I think you're going to have to realize the reality is that it's not going to go to a place where it was before. Many people now see, hey, I can work from home and actually get more done because I'm focused on what needs to be done, particularly the knowledge workers. People are coming up with ideas and they're kind of collaborating with others. And so I think we have to make a shift. Too much of the industrial revolution, there was a lot of good there. But one thing that they gave us that I don't think is as good, particularly today, is that you get paid for your time. On a so much for an hour rate, you're going to, you work an hour, I'll pay you X dollars, X euros, X yen, whatever it will be per hour that you're here. And really, when you think about it, I mean, if you buy a car, do you care how many hours it took to make the car? Nope. Not really. If you're going to buy a car, you care about what does it do these certain things that I need? Does it have this kind of equipment in it? What's the price? Is it within my range, et cetera? Those are the things you care about. And if they made that car in 15 minutes because they used robots and did an excellent job with it and it was really, really good and getting good ratings, you think, okay, that's good. If it took them 15 days to make it, but it's still a good car, you okay, you don't care how long it is. And I think what managers have to do today is in today's world, you need to assign tasks, not based on the number of hours, but on objectives. Mm. What needs to be done? What are the results that you need? I remember seeing that uh, one of the places I visited, I did a, a, one of my round the world trips. I went to Estonia a few years ago and I went to Skype's headquarters there in uh, Tallinn, in Estonia. And they showed me how they have a spa, they have a pool there, they have all these things and it's open 24-7. And they said, here's how we do it. We make sure that people know they've got work to do and they really need to get it done. But it's like, if Eric, you were working for me and I needed something done, I'd say, okay, Eric, this needs to be done by next Thursday at three o'clock. We've got a meeting at three o'clock. Is that doable on your schedule? And if you and I agree to that, we say, now from this time to next Thursday at three, if you need to get up at uh, two in the afternoon and go to uh, your daughter's uh, ballet practice or soccer game or whatever, you don't even have to ask permission. You just do it. But you also know you must deliver the results that we expect Thursday at three o'clock, because if that doesn't come through, then we might have to have a conversation. And we might have to look at what's going on. And I think it's a way of a more mature, more adult way of dealing with people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we've got to start making our shift and look at what's happening in the marketplace right now. As we're doing this recording, we're seeing the great resignation. Mm -hmm. Many people are saying, I don't want to work at this job anymore. I don't want to have to go back and be there, fight the traffic, sit in a cubicle all day and do these things. Uh -uh, I want to do something else. Now I might come in and we get it. It would be good to have a monthly or a weekly, probably weekly is better meeting. So everyone's going to get together and we're going to talk about what we did on Thursday at five o'clock or whatever it'll be, or we're all going to meet on Thursday. That's the day we come in, or maybe Tuesdays and Thursdays we get together, find out something there. But I think the real key and the message I would give to managers is, first of all, understand that's a new world. Secondly, look at what needs to be done, focus on the results. And number three, be flexible, mm -hmm. learn how to adapt and adjust. Realize that you need to adapt, your people need to adapt, and right. sometimes you might have to put in, you know, this many hours, or maybe this many, notice my hands are off the screen there, this many hours. Other times you can get the job done here. What matters is the results that we're getting, not so much the number of hours that you're putting into it. Right. How, how much technology is too much technology? When it gets in the way of getting the results you need, and I think when you get too busy, it says the Japanese say, too much mind, too much going on in your, in your head. And there's just not a good way to handle that. I like the way uh, Clay Shirky says it when he talks about information overload. People say, oh, I've got too much overload, like having too much technology. But Clay says it's not about information overload. It's about filter failure. We need strong filters to say, hey, this is what I need to do. These are the tasks that need to be completed. Right. What technologies usually it's plural, what technologies can help me facilitate that and get it done better? Mm -hmm. When you've got a cell phone in your hand that gives you the ability to connect with people in multiple ways, hey, that's a good thing. You need to learn what is the most appropriate tool at that time. Sometime 
Sometimes a text message is the appropriate thing. Just a quick text message. Hey, Eric, I'm running 15 yeah. minutes late. I'll be there for our meeting a little bit later. Okay, got it. No problem. There are other times I want to pick up the phone and use a Zoom call or FaceTime or some other video way. Say, Eric, you've got to see this. I'm out here over at 4th and Main, and look what they've got here. Look at that. I was thinking yeah. of you. I thought you would want to see that. So I can use that. Or other times, it could be asynchronous, where I just say, okay, Eric's busy right now, but I'm going to shoot the video for him. Mm -hmm. I'll shoot this video, dump it up to uh, put it on uh, YouTube as an unlisted file, and then say, Eric, I thought you would enjoy this video that I just saw. I got this just for you. Here's the link. You catch it then when it's appropriate and convenient for you, and you can watch it there. I'm using different kinds of communication there, but I make sure that I control it and it gets the job done focusing on the results and on building relationships. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I can speak for hours with you, Terry. It is, I, I just want to look at the future um, with all the tools and, and ask you, how, how do you see uh, technology keep on developing or emerging or what's going to happen if I look at Slack? Telegram, uh, you know, signal, messenger, text, email. Uh, I mean, it's 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 becoming insane. Uh, I text you on WhatsApp because did you get my message that I sent you an email and oh, can you put it in Slack? And sometimes, quite frankly, I'm getting crazy. And yes. I'm not even talking about Vimeo, YouTube, uh, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, whatever. How do you see those technology in the future? Is, is, are we going to see some kind of merging or, or some technology will go up or some what's going to happen? I wish I knew because then you and I could retire very comfortably. But uh, <laughs> I don't know exactly. But I do know this. We're going to want to communicate. We want to do that. And I think what we have to do is we have to build in certain tools. Like, for instance, have you ever had someone tell you, well, I sent you in whatever the message is. I sent you an email. I sent you a telegram. I sent you a Facebook message and you didn't get it. Well, just because you send it doesn't mean they got it. I remember in undergrad school, I was taking a communication course. And one of the things I learned there, one of the greatest things was that meaning is in the mind of the receiver. I might know what I'm saying, but what really matters is, did it get through to you? Now you could go, yeah, okay, I understand. Good thing to do is to say, okay, let's just throw the word really clear. Tell me what you heard and what you understand. And then I'll tell you what I understand, what I heard from you. That's called communication. Right. And we're saying we'll do that. And I think also sometimes you have to say, I'm going to send you an email by three o'clock tomorrow afternoon talking about this subject. Is that convenient for you? Whereas that way you can say, yes, email will work. Or, you know, I really prefer a text. Okay, you prefer text, then that's good. I know that and I will know, put it in here and maybe even put it into my, uh, uh, my CRM. Eric prefers this form of communication when we're doing this. Right. And so I can make sure that I keep track of that. I'm actually uh, close to having an out of office permanently on my email saying that I'm checking emails twice a day. If it's really urgent, text me because it's, it's becoming insane. It is, and particularly when you get so many messages. I remember uh, when I was a, a journalist for a business journals and doing a lot of writing there, I'd get easily three to 400 email messages a day. <laughs> and many of them were really good. I needed to know those. Many of them, though, were not for me. And you have to develop those filters. Again, going back to Clay Shirky's idea, have really good filters so that you know I'm going to get these and I'm get these, et cetera, and not those. And what you might do in that case is uh, many people will say, okay, I'm going to have this email, which will be viewed by my assistant who can do the filtering for me. And I'll have this one, which only very close friends or family members have. And so you we do it that way. That's another way you can keep it blocked off. I see people that uh, do that. I had a chance a little while ago to uh, work with a guy named Carlos Slim down in uh, Mexico. He asked Mexico, me to be an yeah. opening uh, keynote address for a big group of very wealthy people in South America. We were down in Colombia and he was talking about how he has different forms of email. Here's a way to get through to me here. His family has that. Others that uh, people that are close businesses can get that. Others, he has his people who are acting as filters for him. And I realized here's a man that at one time was the richest man in the world and a very, very smart man and still going really strong. Uh, and I just admire him greatly, but he has those filters set up. And I see that with others who are doing very well. They make sure that they're operating it and really taking the principles of people like Peter Drucker 
who wrote a book called The Effective Executive back in the 60s, early 60s, still applies today. Of course, he didn't talk about the technology we have today, but he talked about the principles of blocking out your day and having times to just think, having times to get the work done, have that kind of discipline to say, okay, I get up early in the morning and I do it from this time to that time, if that works for you. Or maybe it's a time at night. You say, before I go to bed, I like to take some time to do this or that and to have priority for those things that are important to you. Like, for instance, it might be family. It might be other relationships you have. Block those in beforehand and treat them as sacrosanct so that un barring an unknown emergency, you're going to be with this person or you're going to be working on that at that time. And I think that's where we'll solve a lot of the technology problems by using non-technology, by using those principles, time-honored principles that help us to run our lives far better. Awesome. I know the title of your next book, Terry. What, what Peter Drucker and Carlos Slim told me about communication. There you go. Actually, I'm thinking about doing that. It was a wonderful being with him. By the way, I got to say, we had a chance. It was a, a meeting that wasn't just one day. It was one of those uh, like multiple days. I think it was like three or four days we were there with him and got a chance to see him and his family, his son, his grandson, his daughter, get a chance to work with them and interact. Wonderful people. And I find that people that are really successful, many, many of them, I can't say all, but many, many of them, like Carlos, very kind, very gracious and, and giving. And I think that's probably why they are where they are. They were kind to people. I don't think you get ahead by being a jerk or some other colorful military expression that we've right, heard. Right. <laughs> I think you get there by treating people with decency, with honor and respect. And that translates to business. It's also being a good, decent human being. Absolutely. Love it. The great words of conclusion. Terry, thank you so much for taking the time. How do people get in touch with you? Well, the best way would be probably over on my website. That's where I've got my social media contacts. You can do that. And you would just go to terrybrock.com. And I'll spell that because Terry can be spelled a couple of different ways. And it's T-E-R-R-Y. And Brock is spelled the right way. B-R-O-C-K. So it's uh, Terry at Terry Brock is my email address. Terry at terrybrock.com. And go over to terrybrock.com. You'll see all that contact information. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I can't wait to see you again live. Great to be with you, Eric, and looking forward to that in-person live. Terry, thank you so much for taking the time today. Truly enjoy our conversation. Uh, once again, if people want to uh, connect with you, they go to uh, terrybrock.com. And uh, if they want to connect with me, please go on LinkedIn or join my Facebook group, www.eventbusinessformula.com slash group. And if you had any value with this uh, podcast, please share it with your friend and your network. And don't hesitate to uh, give us a great rating on uh, whatever platform that you're listening to this podcast. Thank you. Bye-bye.